So hi, everybody. I'll uh, do my best to talk slow, but sometimes I get excited. So raise your hand uh, using the, uh, um, uh, what do they call them? The uh, uh, reactions in case I'm going too fast. Um, uh, I sometimes get excitable. So um, I wanted to talk today uh, about gRPC, uh, specifically in ASP.NET Core, though uh, we'll talk a little bit about how it's uh, used across different languages. So in case you don't know who I am, I'm an a author, instructor, and coach. So uh, um, you may know me, uh, most people know me best from my Pluralsight authorship. Uh, I also run a company called Wilder Minds Training that we do our own training of different sorts you can see here. I also make movies. Uh, this fall, a movie will come out about software development called Hello World, and I'm uh, excited about that. So feel free to check that out. And the end of the ads, let's talk about uh, APIs. <clears throat> so uh, distributed APIs in the way we think about them uh, in uh, using them in REST, which is probably the most common these days, uh, have a really long uh, history. Uh, when I started putting this together and I realized that back in uh, the 70s, which are is probably before most of you were born, um, we had already the beginnings of this idea of uh, distributed APIs, computers needing to talk to other computers. And the, the first three ideas that sort of came out of that were RPC, which stands for remote procedure call, and then messaging and queuing. Now the messaging and queuing might sound surprising because uh, we still continue to use those ideas today in a lot of what we do. Uh, RPC, not so much, but we'll see that uh, gRPC is going to sort of hang on the back of that. Uh, soon after, as the mid 80s uh, through the 2000s, we did a lot with object oriented API. So uh, common D comma, if you were in the sort of um, Microsoft space, Corba and Java RMI, if you were in the Java space. Uh, and these were ways to sort of expose objects across different machines. And finally, when the, the web started to become a big deal, we got our first sort of APIs with H, uh, uh, XML, HTTP. REST was sort of introduced, but not adopted hugely yet. SOAP came in and was pushed a lot by Microsoft. And then more recently, you'll see that GraphQL and now gRPC are new ideas that have come on uh, pretty lately. And so this problem we've been trying to solve for a long time, uh, we've solved in a bunch of different ways. And these solutions end up, um, end up being a more, more of a reflection of the kind of code we're writing instead of being something new. In many ways, uh, REST, SOAP, gRPC, and the original RPC are very similar in what they're trying to do, and that is just have this uh, communication back and forth between machines, whether that's a client machine or whether that's server to server or server to partner, as we'll see. So from the website, it talks about gRPC as being a high performance open source universal RPC framework. So a framework for doing remote procedure calls. And uh, so you might be wondering what gRPC stands for. And if you look on the website, it actually says it stands for gRPC remote procedure call which I think is sort of a wink and a nod. It's, uh, I think they're trying to be funny by using their own acronym as the first G. But I think we all know it's actually, uh, was originally uh, um, developed at Google. And so I think it was Google's RPC, but now they're trying to back away their sort of identification from it. So know that this idea and some of the tooling around it come from uh, uh, big companies like Google and Microsoft or two that have really embraced it in a large way. So what does that really mean? What is gRPC? It's a binary communications between uh, a client and a server. Uh, they're contract based. So if you've done WCF before, that should be familiar. And that's where you agree on how the communication happens. This is a difference from the way that REST works. Uh, it's available across ecosystems. So it's, uh, you can create clients and servers and Python and Java and C and C++ and obviously .NET. Um, it's secure by default because it requires HTTPS to work. And one of the bigger features that a lot of people use it for is unidirectional and bi-directional streaming. So a lot of what we do over the web 
is um, uh, message oriented. So we send a message out and we receive a message back. And I'm so sorry, that should be uh, muted. <laughs> Embarrassing, especially because I'm gonna post this video and they're gonna now have my ringtone on it. I uh, hope everyone's getting a nice laugh from that. So this idea of, uh, of the web normally being message based where you send a message out and then one comes back there's been often a need to actually stream data to have a longer lived connection. And a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 web frameworks have sort of made this happen by sort of uh, manipulating the way that um, the web works. Well, in HTTP2, they've introduced a uniform, a, a, uh, a solidified way of doing this streaming. And that's what gRPC uses for this streaming. So we're still talking about a web uh, API that goes over the web. Um, it's just, uh, it's uh, relying on some things to keep connections uh, open longer, which this may be familiar if you've ever done SignalR, it may remind you a little signal R, uh, of SignalR, and we'll talk about that soon. So one of the ideas here is that we've been building REST uh, uh, for a while, and um, a lot of what REST ends up doing is uh, CRUD or uh, create, read, update, and delete, uh, and for purely web apps. And I want to talk about where gRPC fits into this, because a lot of times when you hear about a new uh, remote procedure call or messaging framework, it always feels like, oh, this is the next big thing, and I'm going to abandon everything I've done. And I don't think REST is going away. We also have seen uh, SignalR, which does multicasting and web messaging in a really robust way, and that's not going away. You'll also see GraphQL as sort of a, a, a new um, um, API out on the, um, in the ecosystem, and uh, GraphQL is really great when you need to sort of um, create a, a schema and then be able to query it versus doing um, more uh, fixed messaging. And then into the mix is GPR, uh, gRPC, which is great for streaming, low resource clients, and inter-data center communication. And so I'll talk about that a little more to sort of explain what I mean by that. Introducing gRPC doesn't mean REST is dead and you should abandon it and stop using it. I really have this idea of starting to use different API uh, mechanisms for the right tool. Like right, rewriting everything gRPC wouldn't be any better than uh, using REST in most cases. And so um, in that same way, you might have gRPC sitting next to your REST, sitting next to your SignalR, and sitting next to your um, uh, GraphQL if you're using that as well. So it's it, there isn't one framework to beat them all. So let's talk a little bit how it works now that I've sort of given you the, the, over, um, the um, overview. So gRPC is tied to HTTP2. So this does limit some of its usage because HTTP2 isn't universal yet. It certainly will. Some browsers support it, some don't. Um, and clients must support this protocol. Now, when you're using something like Java, or um, uh, C Sharp, they support HTTP2, but um, a lot of, of web servers don't yet. The format is ordinal and binary based, so the actual message is quite hard to interpret um, for human eyes. So you know how you're met, you may be sending JSON or XML over the wire, you can look at that and go, oh, that's formatted correctly. It's a little harder, and it is actually, because it's binary, harder for JavaScript to parse. And contracts are required, which typically makes it not great for web uh, websites. There is a, a tool called gRPC Web, and it uses a different protocol and essentially just allows you to make um, calls from JavaScript to gRPC. And for cases where you need a strong contract, it's a great solution. So in, in my view, gRPC is this technology that fits in a couple of places. So when we're designing websites, REST is still probably the most ubiquitous and the one that's gonna work the best with browsers of today. That may change over time, but 
right now, I think that's the case. And then inside your data center, you might use gRPC to communicate between your services. And this is important to me because having that tight coupling of a contract gives you a lot of benefit, whereas having a tight coupling to your um, web APIs may not be. If you're using a, a, a writing mobile apps, using REST or gRPC might be a good solution there depending on what you need. Um, and then within your data center to other services, you might also use gRPC. So you, you can see one space I really see this is inside the data center. Another place is going to IoT devices. One of the benefits of gRPC is that because it's binary and um, it, the contract knows how to deserialize it, the deserialization and serialization of it is much quicker than JSON. And so when you have resource constrained devices like uh, Internet of Things devices uh, often are, gRPC represents a really easy way to do that. And using gRPC out to partners where again, that contract is really useful um, is some place that I, I see it being used uh, uh, quite a lot where you both can agree what this communication should look like and you can both implement it really in any language you want to. You don't have to have an agreement to using .NET or Java or whatever the, the language that uh, your partners are using. So let's talk about contracts. Contracts uh, are, are generated in the case of, um, of gRPC. So basically you have a format and um, it uses something called protocol buffers, which is a language that's actually used in a number of different places, but uh, gRPC is a main place to do that. And so from this protocol buffer language, which I'll show you in a minute, you can, depending on what language you're using, develop a client and, and or servers from that contract. That interface definition language of protocol buffers is the contract itself. So the language itself is language neutral, so it's not tied to any specific language and even platform neutral. You can ex uh, um, extend it and of course it's serializable. And like I said, it's not specific to gRPC. So some of the performance sort of considerations you can see here, protocol buffers are much, much quicker to serialize, but especially to deserialize. So decoding protocol buffer because of the contract uh, can really help you. Now, if the only reason you're gonna go to gRPC is for speed, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, organizations are like, well, we wanna go to gRPC because we wanna use the fastest. So sometimes the serialization speed doesn't really matter in the big picture, you know, network communication speed and some other things might matter more. So don't use gRPC just because the serialization is faster. We had this sort of discussion between JSON and XML and binary versus not binary. We've had this communicate this discussion a lot and speed isn't always the best reason. So I've, I've talked your ear out with off with, um, with uh, uh, slides, let's go ahead and build something. I have a um, a project here, which I'll I'll share on my website afterwards, so you won't have to see it. And it doesn't have gRPC in it at all; hasn't been added anywhere to the project. And we're going to start as if we uh, were going to. So if we run this project, just so you can kind of see, it's just a website. forgot to tell it to uh, load up the project. And so I'm just over here. I'm going to make sure that it's calling HTTPS, localhost. And I'm using a self-signed certificate. So of course, it's I haven't trusted it yet. And so it's just a website, right? There's no real magic here. It's just an ASP.NET, out of the box, simple website. So what we want to do is be able to write an API here and use it from some client. We're not going to use the um, the website as the client. We're going to actually use a just a console app as the client. So you can see what that experience looks like. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a folder called protos or just let's say proto. And this is where our protocol buffer files are going to sit. 
and into this folder, I'm going to say add new item. And if you have a, a Visual Studio 2019, you'll see that protocol buffer file is actually one that's included. And I'm going to just rename this uh, our, I'm just going to call it weather. And it starts out with just a couple of very simple um, uh, pieces. First, it's saying what version of the proto language am I using? Uh, this is a requirement with a proto file. There is a proto, uh, proto 2 as well, but we're going to use proto 3 for all of gRPC. And this is a special option for C Sharp's generation to know what is the namespace I'm going to generate this in. I'm not actually going to say generate this in uh, w, um, um, what is my project name then services. I'm just going to change that namespace. And the first thing I want to do is create something called a package. And I'm going to call this weather stations. The package is essentially a, uh, the, the generated server side code needs to go inside of its own namespace and it will be under this namespace. So a package is just the way that uh, protocol buffers allows you to import entire files uh, amongst each other. So you can share certain definitions. We're going to do everything in one file for simplicity. And then let's create our first message. So this language has this idea as these two interesting ideas. One is a service and I'll call that weather service. And this, you can notice it's a C like a syntax, but uh, um, so you should be comfortable with that. And in this weather service, this is the endpoints we're going to define that we can call them. But before we define that, we're gonna want these messages, which are essentially the data types that we wanna communicate through. Uh, very rarely will you use just um, um, simple data types. So we're gonna first put together a weather request. And what does this type look like? Because that's, that's what a message really is. Uh, it's gonna just have one, uh, property in it, it's going to be the station ID. So this is going to be a property that says, uh, what station ID are you requesting for? And then uh, someone can make that request. And one of the weird things that you'll see is this equals one. This is not assignment. This is you dictating what the ordinal number of the serialization is. And this is a key to why or how it handles uh, 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 versioning. So as this weather request changes, you can add whatever properties you want, but you can never change that the weather station is an int32 and that the ID is one. And so instead of having a versioning scheme, like having different version numbers, they're basically saying this ordinal number and this data type are gonna be set in stone. And that's how the contract really works. We're gonna create another message called a weather response, whoops. And it's gonna have uh, three pieces of information. It's gonna have a float that the temperature. And again, I'm gonna give it the ordinal numbers for um, serialization. Again, these are not initializers. They're, this is not dictating what the default value is. And so this is typically the way these would look like this is one, this is two, this is three. If you wanted this to be uh, five, four and seven to leave room, you can, but typically you're just going to number them one after another. You can mark certain um, um, properties in here as uh, no longer needed, but you can't reuse the ordinal number. That's essentially the idea there. And so now that we have a request and a response, what are we going to do? We're going to create an RPC call and I'll call it get weather. And in here, we're going to say we're going to send a request and we're going to say that the service returns a weather response. And so this is a very simple um, uh, interface, interface uh, um, definition language to say this is what a call from our service and to our service looks like. This file will be used both by the client and the server to agree on how the communication happens. And because of that, 
when serialization and deserialization happens of that binary pack, it uses this to know how to serialize and deserialize. This is just the recipe for serialization. So uh, let's look at the weather here, and I'm going to actually look at the properties of weather. And we'll see that for a build action, we don't actually have a, a, a type to generate these proxies. That's because out of the box, um, the gRPC libraries aren't included, and we won't be able to tell this to generate it until we make that change. So let me open up NuGet. And I'm going to actually look at gRPC, and there's one specifically down here for gRPC ASP.NET Core. This is a meta package for clients and servers. So we're just going to install that one. I wish there was a way to tell it to never ask me for another uh, license. And so we've got gRPC installed now. And because of that, if we look at properties again, I'm going to pin this down here. We'll see that we now have a type for protobuf compiler because we want to take that protobuf and we want to compile some code. And so in this case, we're going to create a, the client and server packages. So this is going to allow us to create only the client, only the server, or to just include the file and don't generate um, the subclasses at all. In that case, it's just going to generate the message types for you. But for this example, we want client and server. And so what happens here? When we do this, what we're actually going to get is a, is a service class that we can implement. And so I'll call this whether gRPC service. Putting G, gRPC there is not required. It just makes it a little easier. We just got a class here. And what we're going to derive this from is actually weather service, weather service base. Now, where did this weather service come from? This is actually the generated, let me F12 into it, the generated file that that protocol buffer um, build step did for us. It actually generated this as a number of um, methods for a service. So I'm not a huge fan of having a, a nested class here, but it works. And so once we've done that, we can just use override to say there's our method that we defined inside the protocol buffer. And by overriding it, we can go ahead and actually implement it. And so how do we implement that? Uh, we're going to do it really, really simple. Um, I'm actually going to come in here and just call, let me get my mouse back, ta uh, return task, since it is asynchronous by default, from result, because we don't have anything uh, that's actually asynchronous to do it. We're just going to say get um, weather. Oh, that's the name of this method. We can't use it again. Get weather data. And I'm going to go ahead and just tell it to implement that method for us to actually fill in here. And we're, we're doing it as, in its own call mostly because we're going to re reuse it a little later. So what does get weather do? It's going to go ahead and I'm just going to create a, a random here. I'm not going to seed it. And then I'm going to create a new weather response. I think I need to bring in the namespace. Oh, I misspelled response, response. I'll fix that later, but for now that'll be good enough. And of course the weather response is gonna have those three pieces of data, right? It's gonna have temperature. And in this case, I'm just gonna generate a, a fake value. So I'm just gonna make this into a fake value for us. And I'm going to do this the same for the other two. Wind speed, of course, wind speed isn't going to be that fast, so I'll make it times 50. And then for rain amount, 
I'm going to do 10. So all I've done here is really just fake some weather data because we don't actually have a, a weather, weather monitoring service here. And I'll just return that res here. So hopefully this has made sense. I have this uh, type that came from the proto file. This is what generated that, that uh, overridable method. And these are what created the types that I need, weather request and weather response. If we go ahead and fix that name here, of course we'll get a change here and a change here. And let's see if it builds. One more place. Make sure it builds. Be amazed at how many times one little misspelling can cause you. Okay, we have our service generated. So now let's talk about creating that client so you can see it actually work. We, uh, we're exposing, um, actually before we do that, I'm gonna go to startup because once we have included the service, we still need to add it to ASP.NET. So this is, again, just a website. It does not have to be a full website. It could be just for gRPC. But I want you to see that you can just say add gRPC. And that's going to add all the services for gRPC inside configure services of startup. And then down here in endpoints, you can say map gRPC service. And then here we're going to give it that service name, which is um, weather SVC, I think we called it. No, we called it gRPC service. Let's bring that namespace in. And so here we're just literally saying, also listen for anyone making a call to a gRPC service and map it to our class here. And so just because we have controllers and razor pages and uh, even REST APIs doesn't mean we can't also have gRPC. So having them side by side is not uncommon at all. So uh, making sure it builds, you can go clockwise speeds up builds. I don't know if you know that, you should. And then down here in the client, I'm gonna just go to the client itself and I'm going to say, add service reference. So if you're old school like me, you probably remember add service reference as a way to add a reference to a, GR, uh, to a WCF project or to a SOAP project. Um, gRPC as well as open API, but gRPC will allow us to do that. So we're gonna create a gRPC and we could point it at an URL that had the proto, which is how you might um, sort of do handshake between two uh, objects. But in this case, because it's in the same project, I'm going to actually just point it at my proto file in my project. It's just going to be a relative path uh, effectively. And so this is adding the NuGet packages as well as generating it. So let's close that. And now that we have that, we'll see that we have a shared reference to that proto file. This, is a, uh, this isn't a copy, this is a, that's what that little arrow is for, it's saying it's a link actually to the other file. And so over here in, in, um, in uh, the uh, console app, what do we wanna do? There's a few pieces here that are important to get right. So first we're gonna generate something called a channel and there's a G, uh, gRPC channel where we can just say, create a channel for a specific address. And because we know the website address, whoops, too many O's. We can create a channel directly to that web uh, address. If you were using certificates for authentication or other things, you would do this a little differently, but for our very simple example, this should work. And then we're gonna create a client object and this is going to be a weather service client. And this again is a, um, a, a, a nested class. So let's bring in that weather service by bringing in our gRPC services. 
And here we're just going to pass in that channel. So effectively said, where do we find the gRPC client? And then let's create a client so we can actually make method calls. This is a generated class just like the server was. And so this then becomes, let's just make it loop forever. Let's do console read line. Uh, this is mostly so that we can just loop uh, by pressing space to do the call over and over again. And then I'll just say, let's go ahead and create a request. Remember what we're passing in, actually we don't even need a request there. Let's do it this way. Uh, the response from the gRPC will be client.getWeather. Notice there's an async version as well, but because we're in a console app, I'm not gonna bother. And here we want to pass in the actual uh, request. And so how are we gonna do this? I'm just gonna create a new weather request object. And this weather request, just to be clear, is actually the data type that we generated from the proto file. This isn't, a, uh, this isn't special in that way. And the only piece of data we need here is some station ID, which if you remember, we're not gonna be using station ID, but this will uh, uh, allow us to expand on it later. And when we get the response, we're just going to say console dot right line response. And I'll just use a little C sharp magic to go ahead and force it to serialize it. And it'll serialize as a uh, little piece of uh, JSON for us, actually, even though the data coming back here, I'm sorry, uh, as an object. And so with these two pieces, there's not a lot to it. You may notice that uh, I want the startup projects to be both projects. In this case, I'll make this start and start because the server and the client are both going to need to be running at the same time. So if I've done everything right, no promises, let's go ahead and see if it works. And so we'll see here, we actually have two windows and I'm going to see if I can get them both to fit on the screen at once. And it's actually showing you that it's executing the, the message for the gRPC weather station. And so as I hit enter each time, you'll see that I'm making that conversation back and forth. And so what does this really mean for us? Let me go ahead and close these. This uh, zoom bar is super in my way. Um, so what does this mean for us? It means we can define a contract for a service instead of just using the way that maybe you would by crafting, a for, crafting this up for, for um, REST where you have sort of an agreement on both sides or using open API to sort of define that contract. Um, but it also means that those those messages coming across are really, really quick. Couple of caveats here. One is that it has to be HTTPS. So um, under Visual Studio, it will just accept the uh, self-signed certificates. But also what you may not have seen here, let me set this as startup for just a minute so you can see, is I'm actually using the gRPC, oops, right here, the gRPC um, execution here. I'm not using IIS Express. And this is important because IIS Express as well as IIS don't support HTTP2 yet. The native console app will, but uh, IIS will not. So this is a limiting factor right now until uh, HTTPS is, is supported there. This actually comes down to HTTP, uh, HTTP.sys doesn't support it yet, which is how what all that stuff is sort of built on top of. Um, hopefully that'll be coming soon. Microsoft is certainly working on that, but right now it is a limitation. It also means that because uh, web apps inside of Azure um, app services um, uses IIS to do all that hosting, these aren't supported in app services yet. So it depends on how you're, how you're hosting them. I do most of my hosting inside of uh, Docker containers anyway, and so it hasn't become an issue for me at all. But for some clients, you'll, you'll want to sort of think about that. So let's expand on this a little. 
Let's talk about the streaming because that's a one place where it becomes really, really useful. Let me make sure we're doing on time. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes. We'll be able to get streaming working. So inside of the proto file itself is natural um, support for streaming. So let's create another RPC endpoint. And I'll just rename this to get weather stream. And in this case, uh, I will just add the word stream. So th this method call, when it gets generated, is going to, instead of returning, a, expecting you to return a weather response, to actually give you a stream that you can write weather responses into, right? We're still using those same messages. We're just saying, we're going to stay open until you have sent as many of these as you want to send. And once we save that, it'll be actually generated on both sides. So let's go back to the gRPC service and let's override the new method. Oops. There's our get weather stream. And what you'll see here, let me break this into a couple of lines, is it sends in the request so you can get what the data is and then also sends you a response stream that you can write into. And so how are we gonna actually do this? We're just gonna say, you know what? I, I wanna send 10 different responses here. So I'm just gonna create a quick for loop. It was the last time you used an actual numbered for loop. It isn't very often for me. So I'm gonna send 10 responses and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a wait in this case. And of course, I'm going to add async to the method type here because it returns a task. We can use uh, asynchronicity. And I'm just, just going to say response stream dot write async. And then here I'm just going to say, what did I call the method right up here? Get weather data. Get weather data, right? I'm going to tell it to write one of these weather datas in. Um, and then I'm going to just say task.delay. Probably shouldn't use this in your real servers, but it works for this. We're going to wait half a second and we're going to add another. We're going to add another. We're going to do this until the 10 runs out, right? We're essentially holding on to this connection and then streaming data through. So instead of for each, you could be waiting for some case, like waiting for the uh, uh, an asynchronous call from a uh, from one of the instruments to come back or to wait for a reset to make sure that the machine is, is back. So this call um, on the server could be more complex than you might imagine. I'm just using delay to sort of uh, um, imply that. So with this very simple server call now built, let's go over to program and let's change this to be that. So I'm going to comment out this call for response. And let's go ahead and comment it out. And down here, I'm going to actually call get weather stream instead. Now the, the get weather stream here Oh, I think I need to build it before it'll build the, the client after the changes. Let's go clockwise, see if it fixed it. Yep. Is what this response actually will give you then is instead of giving you just a weather response, it's going to give you this type that is a uh, async server streaming call. So instead of just writing out the console once here, what we're actually going to do is get the stream out of it. So the stream is going to be that response dot response stream. This will be the actual stream object that we can get it from. It's actually a reader. Then we could just say while await stream move next. So that we're going to move the response to the first object. And then we're going to say the result is just going to be that stream current, right? Once we've moved the first one,
we can say current, and we'll fix this uh, cur this uh, red squiggly in just a second. And you'll see that how the magic happens. And then we're just going to say console dot right line and do that same trick we did before. In this case, just saying, let's just make that result. Oops, I need another one of those. Write the those out, and then it'll just Keep on writing those out. And I'm going to put a little prefix here that says from stream so you know that I'm not doing any parlor tricks. And in this case, we'll do it over and over again. Now, because this requires async, this can get a little confusing. So instead of that, what we're actually going to do is just, I'm just going to wrap this whole thing and extract a method that I'll call process stream. You love when all your typing goes to heck. Process stream. And of course, it is a, a, a it is a waitable, but there's no way for us to make main Awaitable. So I'm going to actually get rid of the await and just tell it to actually synchronously wait for this to be done. Right? And then our async process can just do what it wants to do. So let's run this and see if I actually have to change this to run the startup projects again. And if I run this, You'll see that we're getting, whoops, it scrolled. We're getting the, the 10 processes. And if I press again, we'll see that every half second, we're getting a 10 process. These are not 10 separate HTTP calls. This is one long lived HTTP call. That's the important idea about what this is. Until that last uh, call is done, this process stream won't come in. And this, this, this is processing it as the results come in. So it runs here and this move next wait is the thing that's actually waiting until the server pushes the data back. It's not pulling from the server, the server is pushing to it. And that's why the streaming becomes so uh, incredibly um, um, important. See how we're doing in time. Oh, we have a few minutes, good. So the last thing I'll wanna talk about that I think is important is the idea of collections, because that's something else that, that is kind of weird. So let's say that we want to create another G, uh, RPC call that says, uh, let's say, um, um, let's call it get weather readings. And I'm not gonna send a stream this time, I do wanna send a weather response but what I really want to do is get a number of weather responses. So I'm going to create another message called readings for lack of a better word. And I want this to be able to return weather responses, right? Weather response is the type and I'll just say, let's call this the readings. Actually, I'll case it because I've just gotten used to that. So this could just be a type here that returns readings, right? Still using the same request object, but in order to make this a collection, instead of saying this is an array, because what is an array in different languages, we're actually going to say repeated. This is the word that makes any type a collection. That's the magic inside of protocol buffer to say, oh, this, I want you to return repeated weather responses, any number, but just a repeated list. And so let's go over to the service and let's implement this. Just like before, we're gonna override and get that new readings method. In this case, we'll use some of the same code. Actually, let's make this simpler. I'm gonna say readings equals new weather request 
And I'll just say I'm going to return an array of them because in the language we can obviously use array. And then I'll just say get weather data and I'll just add a number of these so we have a nice collection. If you're not familiar with uh, collection initializers, uh, you should. Oh, I said request, I meant. Weather response. So there I have a collection of readings and then it becomes, you know, simple like we've done before, which is return task from result. Again, we're only using from result because we don't actually have an asynchronous process to do. And I'm gonna say readings, right? Sorry, new readings, which takes the readings as our readings. Oh, I use the word reading way too many times in that time. But effective, we need to have, we would need to generate that type that we're returning to have to contain more than one reading. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always forget this part. Sorry. Return value is a new readings. So the um, you can't assign the readings because this type actually is, I don't know whether you can see it, it's kind of small on the screen, a repeated field. So instead of assigning it like we would do here, is we're going to generate a new reading object and then we're just going to say return value dot add, I'm sorry, yeah, dot the readings, oh, come on, Sean. I hope you're getting some consolation that uh, your problem typing in front of people isn't much different than mine. And so in this case, we can actually just add that new collection of readings and it'll add them all to that collection for us. So you have to use uh, add and remove to manipulate the collection instead of assigning it. You could actually generate one of these repeated fields, but I find this a lot easier than worrying about those other types. I can stay safely in C-sharp land. And so the, I'll just go ahead and return the return value. And then over here in the API, I'll go ahead and change this to using that as well. Now the difference between, let me, let me talk about this for just a second. The difference between this get weather readings and get stream is pretty dramatic. Get stream is, is sending results as it gets it. Whereas this get weather readings is packaging up five results and then returning it. Uh, this is all in one call. There's no streaming involved at all. So let's change this and I'll comment it out. So it'll be in our source code later our response I had to chuck my old computer and go back to this even older computer uh, the other day so oh, we need to build it first uh, so my type my fingers are still keep on hitting the wrong keys very frustrating here we can say get readings and we'll pass in, like we did with the others, just a new weather. In this case, instead of processing the result, because this is, we aren't processing a stream, instead we're going to, let me just pull this down here, we're gonna say for each, item in response dot the readings, right? This is just that collection we defined. We'll do what would be the biggest surprise, right? We're just gonna say collection item, right? We're just gonna write e each of these out and then wait and we'll see what happens then. So let's run it one more time. Oh, it's still running. All 
And so we can now see that the co collection, oh, that's interesting. I must have uh, did right instead of right line, yeah. to end it again. I hate when it doesn't end it. Come on, you know you you want to work with so, so many windows. And now when you press enter, We'll get more connections. So we can see that's how collections work as well. So we have a couple minutes left. Let's go back to the meeting and uh, let's see if we have some questions. Where, I always forget where this is. Where is the list of questions? No questions at the moment, Sean. No, was I that clear or is everybody asleep? Yeah, I have, I, actually I have a question. I was yes. leaving it for the end, but I can ask it now. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you are showing us how to call a service uh, on the server uh, using gRPC. Is it possible to the server trigger any kind of message in the client? Uh, something like, um, uh, SignalR can do it, okay? Uh, you have both sides uh, taking advantage of the, um, the channel and trying to trigger things on the other side. Yes, you can do it. It's, it's very similar to the way that, that SignalR does it. It is an essentially, you're gonna start a call and wait and uh, just wait for the, you're gonna start it with a stream. That's what the stream is effectively. So you're gonna actually make the call on the client to accept a stream from the server and then leave that open until that trigger happens. Um, okay. And that's and that's not a performance problem. It doesn't uh, uh, does the same thing that SignalR does in that it it uh, it, it isn't uh, taking a thread the whole time uh, and all that. But the big difference between SignalR and what you would get from gRPC here is multicasting. So if you have ten clients you need to send, protocol buffer is about a one to one relationship whereas SignalR is still the best solution for when you want to broadcast a message across to a bunch of different uh, machines. It, it's much better at that than uh, having to craft that up. That's not part of the G gRPC um, use case. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We can get them in the chat if you don't wanna talk mm -hmm. or you just ask out loud and I'll see if I can answer them. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I have a question. Hello. Yes. I have, actually, I have two questions for you. Well, the first one is uh, how can we define optional or nullable properties in the messages? Um, and what about complex types like arrays or even class type properties like uh, uh, subclassing it? I'm not sure if I'm explaining it right. Yes. But, uh, um, all of that is supported in the protocol buffer language. So if you're talking about uh, uh, types, we actually, this is a message that's using a type as a, um, um, using a message as a type. So uh, I guess I'm still sharing my screen. And so it's just that simple. Uh, you can have optional, but the idea of optional is sort of gone from protocol buffer in that uh, because every message, uh, every object uh, message, none of these are actually required. Um, there, so instead of marking optional, all of these are optional right now, but what you can do is say required as part of that contract to make certain ones uh, as ones that have to be filled out. So it's sort of the opposite of marking optional. You're going to mark required for the ones that you have to have. It assumes optional by default. Well, and I have another question in, mm -hmm. in your example, you have the, um, on the server, it supports the standard uh, REST API and also the gRPC side by side. Correct. Under the hood, how does it work? I mean, they they both share the port, the HTTPS port. Correct. So, does it know that this request, in fact, is a standard um, REST to be request to be answered by the REST API, and the other one, the other request, is to be handled by the gRPC? 
processes. Yeah. Does it work? My understanding, because I haven't dug into the actual protocols, is that they're actually using different um, um, uh, identifiers in the actual request inside the headers of the request uh, to determine its 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 um, a gRPC call. So basically, you'll see that uh, we have all the calls here, and unlike um, uh, SignalR, we're not specifying what the name of the endpoint is. It just knows that when someone's requesting something call uh, that's targeting the gRPC service, because remember the client also knows about that type, that it's mapping it to this type. And so it, it has more to do with, uh, I believe it, they're using uh, HTTP headers to actually do that. But it's a standard inside of gRPC to figure that out. And so this would be the same in Java or C++ or, or Python or whatever you want to develop it with. So I can have the same server with more than one gRPC services. Oh yes, right. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, because it's really using this as the 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 uh, identifier to, to to determine which gRP service to go to. It's actually using the the service type that we defined in the protocol buffer, this weather service, as the identifier to find the right service. Okay, great. Thank you. Other questions? While you're getting up your... your uh... Just one sure. small, quick one. This proto folder that you created, is, is it a convention or it's just a name that you came up with? I mean... It's a convention. If you start a new gRPC project inside of Visual Studio, it uses this convention. You can name it whatever you want. It's not magical. Um, it just, uh, it's, but it's a convention. It's, uh, uh, it's one that Microsoft is using and some of the other libraries are using. Because um, you'll notice that, let's look at the, um, let's do it this way. You actually see that when uh, this is, including that protobuf, this is inside the client's project file. It's actually doing it as a relative path to it. So it doesn't care what this is. The, the, the actual, um, uh, the actual link and include um, are just using uh, pathings, so it doesn't matter what you call it. Okay. So let me talk about security for just a moment, and then I'll get to my last slide. Whoops. So it does rely on HTTP, which means that H, uh, which means that HTTPS is required. So um, the spec doesn't talk about it exactly that way, but in practice, you must be using HTTPS for this to work. There's just no way around it. Um, it has its own idea of, of headers, and by including those headers, this is one of the interesting things about um, the way it works, especially in ASP.NET. Let me go back up to startup is if you're using authentication or authorization, let's say you're using JWT tokens or cookies, this is going through that same middleware. So you don't need to secure it in a special way. So if you're using, let's say tokens, all you have to do, so I stopped it, um, is include that JWT token in the, uh, in the header of the call or in the request for the call, and it'll be secured in the same way. More typically inside of a data center, you would use uh, self-signed certificates to uh, secure them. That way you don't have the handshaking back and forth, but that's because you trust everybody in the machines. So it's not that big a deal. Windows Auth should work, but I haven't tested it. I just haven't had a case where running it uh, against Windows Auth should work. But really any security protocol that ASP.NET Core supports, uh, G gRPC also supports because it's using the same pipelines. And the last bit is just where to get it all. Uh, gRPC IO, when you, if you want to really see what the, the whole thing is about, the, the specs for the protocol buffer language, so you can see what all is available for you to do there. And then this slide deck and the demo will be up on my website sometime later today. Any last questions before we, uh, we quit for today? 
Hey, Sean, how are you doing? Uh, thank you for the, the session. It's really good. Can you yeah. touch a little bit on, on versioning of messages and, and any best practices in terms of you know naming or just handling versioning? So versioning in protocol buffers is sort of a sticky subject because it isn't versioned like uh, uh, APIs are versioned. It's really message-based versioning, and it does that um, via those those um, ordinal numbers. So you can um, deprecate some of the numbers, but as you expand a message, it's going to include um, new numbers so it knows where that ordinal is. Because you can imagine if you have a message uh, that doesn't no longer uses the first ordinal, that or the contract is going to say ordinal zero is nothing, and therefore the size in the um, in the binary is ends up being zero. And so it's trying to do this so that old clients and new clients can continue to communicate, but it doesn't do this with a versioning strategy like uh, we're probably used to with REST. Um, it's, a, it's something you'll either love or hate. It's a, um, if you go up to the uh, google.io, there's some discussions on versioning that will explain it better than I can. Uh, people have used it for a lot longer than I have. gRPC has been around for a little while and it's, it's used a lot in the Python and C++ space. Um, so you can kind of see where that is. Hope that helped. Other questions? Yeah, why if gRPC uh, actually chimes in, inside of a data center, why use uh, HTTPS at all? I mean, if everything is inside the data center, what's the advantage of having this bound, bind, bound to uh, HTTPS instead of uh, having the possibility to choose HTTP or HTTPS? Well, the real, the real reason is that the uh, HTTP2 protocol that it relies on requires HTTPS. The new HTTP2 protocol says everything needs to be secured and that the overhead for it isn't, isn't uh, worth saving for the cases where people might not uh, use it with security. I agree with, with the notion, but it's more about the spec than anything. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? If not, I appreciate everyone for being here. Thanks everyone from the United States and uh, hopefully you're doing better in COVID than we are.